Quick, quick, hein? bonjour. Good morning. Nice to be back. Been coming to fields for not as long as Peter Taylor is sat in front of me, but quite a long time. <laughs> Um, okay, so very happy to be here, um, and I want to thank Ava for her talk as well, and I really appreciated how you brought your own story to, uh, you know, some important questions and, uh, um, you know, uh, the difficult history of, of the 20th century, and uh, I wish I was going to talk about something more cheerful. <laughs> but uh, the difficult future of the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century. So I, I'm going to, what I want to do is actually think with you rather than just talk to you, but think with you um, about mathematics education in relation to the, uh, we could call the ecosystem crisis. And, um, okay, yeah. So what are we talking about with the ecosystem crisis? What's that? Um, so just to get you kind of oriented, these are very recent headlines just from last week. Things that no longer work the way they used to. So this is about climate change, obviously. Um, so fire season last, uh, last summer in Canada. Um, more than a hundred fires are still burning. That's not uh, typical. Uh, my favorite one is the last one, a headline I saw just last week in the Guardian uh, website. Um, February is on course to break an unprecedented number of heat records. We're gonna have a record number of heat records in the month of February. So there's something there about second order change, right? It's uh, an acceleration of some kind. And uh, obviously, well, not obviously, but these kinds of uh, headlines, you know, I've been worrying about uh, for uh, most of my life. And so hence I've started for, for quite a long time now to think about, well, what can I do as a mathematics educator? What can we all do as mathematics educators in response to these kinds of headlines? The, the graph uh, in the background, by the way, is um, uh, mean sea surface temperatures uh, between uh, 60 north and 60 south. Um, the gray line, oh, it's blue on here, but this, this line is the 30 year mean. Okay, uh, the, the, the x axis is one year. So this line is the 30 year mean up until I think it's 2015. Uh, this line is 2023 and that one is 2024. So yeah, that's a one degree change from the mean. So a one degree anomaly. If you know a little bit of physics, the amount of energy to heat a body of water by one degree is proportional to the mass. Proportional to the mass. So you think about how much, this is a one of kind of Eva type question. <laughs> think about the mass of water in the oceans. We're actually only talking about the surface, uh, two meters, so it's a bit more complicated, but still that's an awful lot of water. So think about how much energy that is. Um, and the, the oceans act like a kind of storage heater. So they, uh, there we go. They act like a storage heater. So that energy is still there in our ecosystem and it's still gonna check out. Anyway, I'm not gonna talk specifically about climate change, but I'm just getting you in the mood about, you know, the crisis part of my title. Uh, three quarters of land surface and about two thirds of uh, the marine environment have been significantly altered by humans. Um, more than a third of the land surface, that's including all the mountains and deserts and stuff, more than a third of the world's land surface, nearly three quarters of freshwater resources are now devoted to crop or livestock production, 
So what does this tell us about our relationship, the relationship between humans and everything else in our ecosystem? So that's other animals, plants, uh, the rivers, the ice systems, the water systems, and so on. Uh, this is about extinction. So uh, these are accelerating rates of extinction of different uh, animal groups. That was uh, 2018. So um, those are very big picture. They're quite hard to imagine. They're quite hard to work with. Clearly, there's some mathematics. I've just shown a bunch of graphs and some statistics, but they're enormous kinds of problems. And so uh, today I want to focus on something a bit more specific. Again, maybe a little bit in the spirit of uh, Ava's talk, um, something we can dig into a little bit more, um, in a bit more specificity. And what I want to think about is what I just mentioned, the relationship between humans and everything else in the ecosystem and the role that mathematics plays and then and thereby the role that we as mathematics educators might play so to do this um, i want to focus on um, a specific topic it's about wolves wolf populations i recently published an article about this it's, um, and it was sparked this thinking was sparked one day when i read a news report about a wolf cull so a wolf cull is when uh, wolves are shot um, by humans and it took place in um, wisconsin wisconsin in the, the midwest of the u.s the united states uh, a bit of background that i looked up and, and sort of taught myself about uh, the, uh, firstly, wolves were considered a threatened species in the United States until they were delisted under the Trump administration. So hunting, killing wolves was, was a controlled activity um, and largely forbidden, I think. In Wisconsin, uh, the, the population had almost uh, disappeared. And over the last 20 years, since wolves were a protected species, a lot of work had gone on to rebuild the wolf population in Wisconsin. This is a bit different from Canada, by the way. The wolf populations in Canada are, are rather more healthy, partly because there's so much space uh, for them, I guess. Um, so here's, here's a little extract from the report. Uh, Wisconsin hunters killed nearly double their wolf quota in a three-day hunting season, so a three-day period. In just three days this week, Wisconsin hunters killed nearly twice the number of wolves that wildlife managers had intended to be harvested in a brief court-ordered hunting and trapping season. Hunters killed 216 wolves between Monday and Wednesday, well past the 119 quota set by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. The Wisconsin season comes as Minnesota lawmakers and wildlife managers wrestle over uh, whether to allow something similar in that state. So um, I have some questions for you now. So rather like effort, there's some participation uh, involved. So uh, here are the questions I'd like you to think about. Um, and I want to hear some of your thoughts about this. So here are the questions. What is mathematics doing to the wolf? What's it not doing? What's it doing to our relationship with the wolf? What is the wolf doing to mathematics? And what might the wolf respond? I'll give you a couple of minutes. And I'm going to go back to the news report so you can look at that text. OK, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt. I can see, at least here in the room, there's some there's comments on the chat. And I can hear some things happening here in the room. I'd like to. To hear a little bit about those. I, first of all, are, you, uh, are we seeing mathematics in this situation? Yeah, people are nodding. We're seeing some mathematics. Okay, so uh, what, what were you? What were you? Some of the, your, your thoughts. What were some of your thoughts? From uh, the yeah. from the chat, we 
got Jimmy F saying mathematics seems to enable a kind of hubris on behalf of settlers that suggests we can carefully count, monitor, create, and enforce policy, uh, and it's okay to kill the wolf. Zach, what do you think? Uh, we were talking about mathematics is somewhere being used. We don't really see it. No. Like the, the, the people who are making decisions right. probably have some mathematical model that gave them this number of 119. Um, right. But we don't know why or what, or what the inputs are or anything like this. Right, right. So how did they come up with this quota? Yeah. Jimmy Pai asks, the doing of mathematics here is to account for corpses, to arrive at quotas by counting wolves and related resources to describe timeline. And Joyce notes, it's interesting the way the question, what is the wolf doing to mathematics is asked. It seems like mathematics, capital M, is a thing that has agency. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with some of the mathematics that we're seeing here. Um, but I want to also comment on some of the, the other language around in the, just in those few sentences. So we have the concept of a quota. Um, we have wildlife managers, right? So what does that imply? We can manage wildlife. We have the word harvest. So we're not just kind of killing, we're harvesting. As Stephen yeah. made a comment that I'm sorry I missed, but he has another good word for you, Richard. Um, he asks, uh, it states, it is humans who are doing the mathematics and a specific subset of humans. The question assumptions need to be dis disaggregated as per Ava's talk. Yeah. So, um, so something very, that really troubled me when I read this, you know, some of the things that you're highlighting. We're using uh, mathematics, I guess, in this talk by mathematics. I mean, I, I'm not getting into what exactly is mathematics, like uh, Ava's talk. Uh, I'm assuming a kind of general idea of mathematics as we know it. Um, and I can see it here, it's being used to uh, kill wolves. Um, I, I read a book about uh, the ecology of wolves, a tr tremendous book called The Wolf's Tooth uh, by, uh, by an ecologist, I guess. Wolves play uh, an incredibly important role in their usual ecosystems. So um, if you eliminate wolves from an ecosystem, it has an impact on a wide number of other species, right down to butterflies, fish, um, uh, plant species. Um, they're a, what is often called a keystone species. So they, they have this sort of effect on the whole ecosystem. So how does a wolf affect uh, fish, for example? That seems a bit strange. Uh, they don't eat fish. <laughs> when you have a wolf population present, uh, one of their principal food sources are, are deer, and deer behave more cautiously. So they do not go in open spaces, including alongside watercourses, uh, because they're more at risk of being predated. Uh, when they don't eat, uh, when the, the, the deer do not eat the, uh, the shrubs that grow along the edge of the water, courses, the rivers or the streams, they grow taller, they cast more shade, but organic matter falls into the water. And those shady, uh, rich areas along the edge is where many fish actually reproduce. Um, and so uh, when you take away the wolves, uh, the deer are much more, uh, have a much greater impact on some of the, uh, the plant matter and the bushes and trees. Um, and that has an impact on the fish. So it's just one example. You can look at spiders, you can look at butterflies. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, but here we're just uh, killing wolves. And there's a lot of politics involved. It's about farming, uh, farmers. There's many news reports of farmers worrying that wolves are killing their livestock um, and, and so forth. And so a sort of simple solution is um, to shoot them. Uh, but but in a sustainable way, we have this idea of managing the population. 
so um, that's that's kind of some mathematics there. Um, I'm really interested as well, though, in what mathematics is not doing. Okay, what are we not seeing? And that's uh, what I want to explore in the next few minutes. Um, and I have three more prompts for you. So we've got this news report, but I have three more prompts um, to help us think about this situation about these about these wolves. Okay. Um, so here's the first uh, prompt. So this is a visual uh, representation of uh, some uh, mathematical work, fascinating paper <laughs> about how to model wolf populations. And the purpose of the paper was to simplify a mathematical model of the wolf population to something uh, that makes it actually easier to estimate the wolf population. Uh, you, it's quite difficult to go out and count wolves. <laughs> Um, you can you can collect information of wolf presence by looking at tracks, by looking at uh, sometimes they can use helicopters, camera traps. But how do you actually estimate from whatever you collect? How do you estimate a wolf population? Um, and so this model's uh, top left corner um, starts with uh, three uh, four four categories of wolf: the alpha wolf which is kind of the, the, the pair, the male and female, who are the dominant pair in a, in a pack. Um, I was recently challenged about this, but uh, whether that actually is a relevant concept these days, but that's, that's the assumption that these, uh, the authors of this paper use. They have an alpha pair. They uh, reproduce, so they are juveniles. Some of the juveniles, that's J, some of the juveniles uh, disperse. They leave the pack at some point in their life. So that's D, it disperses. Uh, others will stay in the pack and be subordinate. So they are the sub, sub dominant. So that's S. So you have A for alpha, they reproduce, some of them stay, some of them leave. Uh, and some of the dominant, uh, sorry, some of the dispersers become alpha wolves in a new pack. Um, and so, um, and the, uh, you might see uh, an, a little F. There, so this model, they really focus on the female because it's the female that reproduces. It's the female that actually has the pups. Um, and so through some mathematics that I won't really, don't, don't intend to go into in detail, but they gradually, through a series of uh, mathematical moves, reduced uh, this four part model into something that focuses entirely on alpha females. And alpha females are much easier uh, to count. Um, because so uh, there was a question from the crowd about uh, the arrow coming back to A. So the, the, this arrow, uh, does this thing work? Ooh, look at that. So you mean this, uh, oh, this one here. Uh, so uh, I can't remember. I can, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. I can't remember off the top of my head. Gives us something to uh, anticipate and hypothesize. <laughs> yes. Um, so what we get down to though is one, uh, a model based on alpha females. And typically if there's one alpha female per pack, actually you just need to be able to count the number of packs rather than the number of individuals. And that's a lot easier to do in practical terms. Yes, I can hear that. So I'm going to move on to the next prompt. This one's a bit different. Uh, I want to read to you an extract from a poem. The poem is by a British, uh, now uh, the late, the late Ted Hughes. He was the uh, poet laureate in the United Kingdom uh, a long time ago. Um, he wrote a lot of poems that use that involve wildlife, close observation of wildlife. Now, this one is from a poem called Wolf Watching, um, which is about a wolf in captivity, uh, as in the, uh, the background picture. So here's, here's an extract. It's quite a long poem, but here's an extract from the beginning. Woolly bear white, the old wolf is listening to London. His eyes withered in under the white wool, black peepers, while he makes nudging, sniffing offers at the horizon of noise the blue cold April 
invitation of heirs, the lump of meat is his confinement. He has probably had all his life behind wires, fraying his eye efforts on the crisscross embargo. He yawns peevishly like an old man, and the yawn goes right back into Kensington, and there stops, floored with glaze. Eyes have worn him away. The day won't pass, the night will be worse. He's waiting for the anesthetic to work that has already taken his strength, his beauty, and his life. Leave you to think a little bit about that. And here's the last prompt. This is a story um, from uh, Ojibwe uh, people um, about Maingan, the wolf. And uh, I want to be clear where this story comes from. It's not my story, it's on a website. Uh, the Native Lands Advocacy Project, also in the Midwest, the same region where the news, uh, the wolf cull was. That's partly how I came onto it. And it was uh, shared by Wanawan Tanagajik, who's a member of the Makwa clan um, of the Lac du Flambeau band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. Um, and here's the story. The wolf and first man were once brothers. They were companions. Creator told them to walk together on the earth and to name all the plants and animals. When they finished naming all the animals and all of the plants, the creator told Maingan and first man they could no longer live together. It was time for them to go down separate paths. But from then on, they must look out for each other. According to uh, the, the storyteller, Wolf strengthened the animals by removing the sick and weak among them, leaving the healthy ones to replenish the forest, while the humans were to see to it that no harm would come to the wolves. They would always have that relationship, even though they no longer lived together as brothers. Give you more seconds to absorb that. There's a comment in the chat from Stephen. In the seven sacred elder grandparent teachings of some nations, the wolf's teaching is that of humility. I want to come back to these questions. <laughs> and I invite you to think about them a bit more in the light of the additional prompts, please. I'll give you another two or three minutes, so do talk and uh, think. So, uh, thank you. Lots of comments in the chat. Uh, some of them are about the evolution of wolves and dogs. <laughs> um, a few things about the relationship between humans and wolves. Um, concern about what's the context in which mathematics is being used. We can use math to separate ourselves from the wolves and justify whatever we want, or we can use it to highlight what is going on and spark discussion and action. So that, again, uh, rather like uh, what Ava presented uh, earlier. Um, and Stephen Kahn writes, what might the wolf respond? It is obvious that people don't understand wolf mathematics. Okay, what about here in uh, in uh, in the room? What uh, what thoughts were coming up? Can we hear a couple? We talked a little bit about the breadth of the problem and how you could tackle it from a lot of different lenses, mm -hmm. um, and why 
looking at it through mathematics was interesting for us. Okay. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Somebody's being prompted. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, so um, Peter was saying that mathematics is a study of complex systems. Mm -hmm. And I thought about this idea, which um, I could, re could resonate with me. And I'm saying, could math be a lens through which we examine complex systems? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. Um, I, I agreed uh, with uh, Afe, uh, who she's quoted uh, Rochelle uh, Gutierrez, mathematics is a human practice. I, I noticed the word human, it's a human practice, right? Um, it's a way of thinking, uh, she said as well. Mathematics is a way of thinking. I, I, not, by the way, this talk is not against mathematics, so I don't want you to think that, but it is a way of thinking. And it thinks some things, and it doesn't think some other things. And that's why I include, included uh, the poem, for example. This is another way of thinking, right? And, and I think we get something else from a poem about a wolf. This poem makes me see a wolf. It makes me think about the life of the wolf, the beauty of the wolf, the, the existence Wolves are very social creatures. They live in groups. They have social relationships. When you kill a wolf, you kill a sibling or a mother or a daughter or a, a child. Um, I think, you know, many of us know dogs and they seem to live, you know, they're, like, they're not robots. They seem to live in relation with other dogs or humans a, a lot of the time. Um, Mathematics maybe doesn't really capture that. And that's, that's not a criticism of mathematics. It's not what it's for. But maybe there's something there that we need to pay more attention to. Um, the same with the story. It, it brings out something about the life of wolves, in this case, the relationship of wolves to humans, that again, maybe mathematics doesn't really capture. But maybe is important when we're thinking about these questions about uh, the ecosystem and the relationship of humans to everything else in the ecosystem that I began with. Um, some of the responses to the modeling and to the news report were about you know, how mathematics often results in a separation. Um, the model transforms, uh, go back to that image, transforms the rich social life and the inter uh, relation of wolves with everything else in their in their life worlds to some equations we don't see individual wolves we don't see their lives or relationships or, and so forth um, and that's what makes mathematics powerful but how can we keep it keep keep what it doesn't do how can we keep that present when we are teaching mathematics Kind of one of the questions I've been thinking about and trying to illustrate a possible response to that in this uh, presentation. So uh, what I want to do now is share a bit more, a uh, little bit of theory um, to think about this a bit, in a bit more of a, a structured way. And uh, um, a lot of my thinking about uh, learning, teaching, doing mathematics draws on uh, dialogic theory um, and particularly the ideas of Mikhail Bakhtin. Um, and so that's where some of these ideas come from. I'm not going to go into them in great uh, depth, but uh, some high, I think I have three slides with some kind of key ideas. Oh, sorry. First of all, um, why? <laughs> So um, I like this quote. This is from the late uh, Ubi D'Ambrosio. Um, many of you know his work, I'm sure. And really what he says in this quote is, you know, we've been teaching mathematics in pretty much the same way for a long time. <laughs> and it isn't helping humans deal with these big kind of planetary scale problems. 
So maybe we need to try and think of some different ways. Um, he writes it in pretty strong terms. It's our generation, our approaches are not producing the global changes to avoid total disaster. So as, as educators, we need to allow the new generation to think in new ways, um, to socialize students, criticize what is observed and felt in everyday life. Well, how do we bring into mathematics what is felt in everyday life? And I suspect sometimes uh, it, many children don't get that in their, in their mathematics learning. So here, here are some of these concepts I was talking about. First of all, uh, the concept of the authoritative word. Um, the authoritative word, another way to say this is discourses that uh, demand that we acknowledge them and that we make them their own. We make the authoritative word our own. Um, it binds us and it's quite independent of any power it might have to persuade us internally. It binds us uh, kind of externally, if you like. It, it, it comes with authority. It's distant from us. Uh, uh, and its authority comes from its past, from this feeling of its kind of hierarchical superiority. Bakhtin often thought of it. Bakhtin uh, was a 20th century Russian thinker who lived under uh, the um, Stalinist totalitarian regime, for example. So I think he was to thinking about, you know, communist ideology in that society. But it's interesting to think about mathematics like this. It has this past. It is seen as superior. Um, and we we can't necessarily, or our learners, our students, you know, are not necessarily expected to, to question its place. They're just expected to, uh, to acknowledge it and to make it their own. I know some of you in this room and in the, or in this uh, attending today might think, well, yes, we, we want our students to challenge mathematics, but I'm thinking more about the, the broad experience of most learners which is, you know, get this, learn it, learn how to do it the right way and, uh, and, and accept its authoritative uh, nature. Bakhtin also writes uh, about consciousness. Uh, and this is where his uh, dialogic theory is quite relevant. So he thinks about consciousness as a response of the other to the utterance of the self. So when I speak, there is a response. And this, helped me to, this helps me determine my own consciousness. Um, if you think back to, you know, babies, um, they arguably have no consciousness. Their consciousness emerges through their interaction with others. They, they act, they make utterances and uh, those are responded to, and through those responses, their consciousness emerges. And the relationship between the utterance and the response leads to, uh, gives meaning to the self, who am I? So that, there's a lot in there, and I don't want to dwell too much on it. But what it prompts me to think about is our role as educators. So I've done a lot of research looking at how um, uh, in, in classrooms, in mathematics classrooms, we see a process of socialization. Children, uh, learners and the teacher interact through that process. Learners are socialized into the authoritative word of mathematics. In fact, they're socialized into a way of talking and, and, and thinking, which we call mathematics, uh, this human practice. Um, but then, in that process, we have uh, utterances and responses. So the, the, the consciousness of, uh, of the learners is being shaped through that process. Um, and we could think about it as a development of a mathematical consciousness. So this human practice of mathematics comes with a mathematical consciousness, a particular way of living being, doing in the world um, 
mathematics is not just the body of knowledge. Several people have already said that. It's a way of doing, but also a way of seeing and interacting with the world. And so there's a big responsibility there for us as educators. We're not just imparting some knowledge or passing on something. We're actually contributing to the development of a form of consciousness. Um, and so we, we arguably have this kind of responsibility. Um, uh, we are interdependent with our learners and this responsibility, there's an ethical dimension to it. Um, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm asking questions about the nature of that consciousness. And if we are educating math, uh, students, in, uh, socializing them into mathematics in a way that produces people who do this human practice of mathematics without any awareness of its, its limitations of what mathematics doesn't do well, then maybe we have not fully lived up to that responsibility. We've taught them a, something rather narrow. Um, but as we can see, mathematics can do things in the world. Well, the doing of mathematics does things in the world um, that has dimensions that mathematics doesn't address. So we can see that mathematics can de design wolf quotas and models so that humans can manage wolf populations and make decisions about how many wolves is an, an okay number of wolves without necessarily bringing attention to uh, the life world of the wolf, the relationships of the wolf, the dignity of the wolf, uh, the, the beauty of the wolf. Um, and I think when we, if we can bring those things into mathematics uh, education in some way, mathematics teaching and learning, then maybe uh, we develop a broader kind of mathematical consciousness that is, is more aware of its, uh, the, the necessary limits of mathematics. Uh, mathematics, can't, uh, uh, as I've worked on these ideas, I've realized I'm not arguing that we should try to change mathematics. I'm not saying we should put poetry uh, although that's an interesting thing to do, and <laughs> looking at Peter, uh, Peter Taylor, who wrote about uh, Virgil and mathematics a very long time ago, still one of my favorite papers. Um, but I'm not saying we should be trying to change mathematics. Mathematics is very good at what it does. It's very powerful in a general sense. Nothing wrong with that, but it has limits. <laughs> it can't do some things. So how can we teach in a way that keeps that as part of the consciousness? So trying to sum up, and then I hope we'll have some, uh, some discussion. What are, what are we doing when we teach mathematics? Um, are we teaching, are we engendering or creating mathematical consciousness that alienates us all from all the other parts of the ecosystem? an alienating way of uh, doing mathematics. Um, we, this kind of particular form of uh, human practice of mathematics goes very nicely with an administrative bureaucratic uh, way of doing things, managing species comes to mind that uh, we know from um, the Holocaust, a lot of bureaucracy it was a very mathematized bureaucratic process, um, which was actually essential in it functioning. And so we see something similar here. Um, because arguably the way we're doing mathematics at the moment, not entirely on its own, but as part of a broader system economic, political system is destroying our ecosystem as we know it. I don't mean it's destroying the planet. Something will continue. I think our ecosystem is quite robust, but we're definitely destroying the way it is as we have known it for, for the, the most of human uh, existence. And the ecosystem that's what they, yeah, will respond. It will, it will change in response to the presence of humans and the activities of humans. 
So here are my concluding questions. I like to end with questions. And what will you teach when you teach mathematics? Or how will you teach when you teach mathematics? How might you teach differently? How might mathematics be imagined? And what might doing mathematics bring us, or how might doing mathematics bring us into healthy relation with other species? I've tried to give an example today in this talk by putting mathematics alongside other ways of knowing other human practices that we get a, diff a better perspective on all of them, what they do, what they don't do, what they're good for, what they're not good for. Um, so not trying to fuse them, but just putting them side by side. So I end with questions. So now it's over to you to think about the questions and uh, we'll talk a bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. We do have time.